Yeah. All right. So the human body part. Right. This is kind of the beginning, and basically, kind of where this lecture fits in is actually for the folks that do have the book. The, this chapter is actually a rather thick chapter. And it goes over a lot of the physiology, the, the, the how the body works and why it works, and gets into a bunch of the stuff that we actually have broken out and put into the individual lectures. So instead of us going over everything now and then when we talk about cardiology stuff, going over and talking about the heart again, we just kind of add it into there. So. Don't paint too much when you see it. No, still, I would definitely encourage you to read that chapter um, because it, it, it will help. But this is kind of a fairly quick, short thing. And, and basically, this is just kind of the general overview. A lot of this stuff, or some of it, we're going to talk about body systems, which are kind of the different um, functions that the body has, basically. Okay? And then the, some, a lot of it's terminology kind of stuff. So it makes sense. So, so when you're, everybody's talking about stuff, we have to, everybody understands why we're, how, how to describe stuff. Okay. So the basis of all the terminology stuff is basically this anatomical position. Have you all ever seen that drawing? I can't remember who did it. But basically it's a guy standing there with his arms and sometimes he has forearms up anyway. That, this, this is kind of the basis of that. It's the it's person standing forward, standing facing forward, palms forward. So that's the position. So whenever we talk about somebody and we talk about certain terms, this is the position they're in. So if they're upside down, hanging upside down from a car, you can still use the same terms. We just assume that this is the way that they're facing. Does that make sense? <laughs> Let's go. Oh, there. All right. Okay. So the planes, and these basically cross section the body in different ways. So some basically go divided into a forward and a backwards, and some divide things into left, right. And there's multiple planes that we can go through. We'll talk about those here. All right. So these directional terms, left, right. Okay. So again, this has to do with how the patient is. So in this position, right? Because a lot of times we walk up and go, oh, you know, is it the left or right? Well, it has to do with the patient, not how we're positioned. And I still have to kind of go the other yeah, left, that side. Okay. So I'm an actor. That's what I have to do. I have to look at my hands and crisscross them. I don't like that. So <laughs> I don't get to make fun of myself. So, um, okay. So left, right, right. So that's based upon what the patient's left or right. Um, proximal versus distal. Okay. So proximal basically means towards the core. Distal means away. So, and it's in relation to another structure. Okay. So my fingers are distal to my wrist, but the wrist is proximal to the fingers. Does that make sense? Wait, the wrist is proximal. Proximal, right? So the so in relation. So if I'm saying the wrist in relation to the fingers, the wrist is proximal. Because it's above. Right. All right. Well, closer to. Because because oh. if I do this, it's still proximal. So don't necessarily think in terms of above, but which way closer to the core. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So it's distal. The fingers are distal to the wrist, but the wrist is proximal to the fingers. Okay. Okay. And so, but you can do stuff like so, like if I have a fracture of the arm, and you're trying to describe it, is it proximal or distal? Well, the proximal a proximal radial fracture would be up here. Distal radial fracture would be down there. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. okay. um, superior versus inferior. Superior is above, inferior is below. Okay, so the head is superior to the heart. 
the, the stomach is inferior to the heart. Okay. And if y'all have, can, there's like um, the large veins. You have what's called the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Basically, the superior one feeds the upper portion. Inferior comes in from the bottom. Uh, medial lateral. Medial is basically towards the middle. Lateral is towards the outside. So is this the medial or lateral side? Medial. Lateral? Medial. Medial. Lateral. Because you're in space in the opposite direction. Very good. That was a trick. So, but yes. You're right, because right, think in terms of the anatomical position. So yes, so this is, even though I'm, I twisted my arm around, that's still the lateral aspect. Okay, and what determined the lateral and the... So, because lateral is towards the middle. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, lateral is medial towards, is towards, towards the middle. Correct. Lateral is towards the outside, medial is towards the middle. Okay. But remember, we're looking at the body in terms of this anatomically, this anatomical position. So palms are forward, so that makes this the lateral side. Um, let's see. Bilateral is basically both sides. Okay, so if you have a, like a bilateral pneumothorax, there's one on each side. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. All right, superior and inferior. I think that's it. Okay, so questions is on this? Mm -hmm. All right, so cross-section, anterior, posterior. Um, basically, this line get that, right, divides the body kind of in front, back. Right? The front is basically the anterior, also the ventral side. The back is posterior and or dorsal. Right? Any fisherman? The dorsal fin? That's basically the back, so easy way to kind of remember that. Um, and mid-axillary is actually this line that's here, okay? So this is your axillary. Mid-axillary is down the middle. Anterior axillary would be right here. So there's the anterior axillary line. There's also another line that's called midclavicular. So basically the middle of the clavicle, so your clavicle goes from your shoulder to your um, sternum, basically. The middle of that clavicle, basically if you draw a line down, that's mid -axillary. I'm sorry, uh, midclavicular. Pretty simple? Yeah. So a lot of it's just kind of, this part is just kind of memorization. So going, okay. So yeah, so there's a mid-clip, mid-clavicular line, there's an anterior axillary line, there's a mid-axillary line, there's anterior, ventral, dorsal, all of those terms. Okay. Um, the palm, basically this is the palmar surface. At the bottom of the foot is the plantar surface. So the directions, body directions, body names, make sense? Okay. Yeah. All right, so now we're gonna get into positions, and here's five things we'll kind of talk about, right? So somebody who's lying on their back, facing up, is what's called in the supine position. Okay. If they're lying on the stomach, it's the prone position. Okay. Next to them, kind of back up. All of these, the way that they are described is important and really kind of for the documentation. So when you arrive, this is how the patient was found. They were prone supine because it does make a difference in, in actually in, in the legality of what happened. So we get involved in a lot of crime scene stuff. So how we find the patient is important because we have to kind of document that. But then also in some of the medical care, it does make a difference of how, how were they positioned. So how are we transporting them? We have to document how we transported them and what position they were in. So that's where this comes from. Okay. 
Okay. <clears throat> so Fowler. So a person that's sitting up okay, is in Fowler's. And basically what this is, if you notice, they're on a, on a stretcher or a cot. So the legs are out and their head's up. Okay. So that's Fowler's. Some folks will call this high Fowler's where they're bolt like it's a 90 degree. They'll call that high Fowler's. You'll hear that sometimes. But in general, if you just say Fowler's, people kind of get the idea that, yes, they're sitting up. Okay. okay. Yeah. Trendelenburg <coughs> is basically, and I couldn't find the good picture, so this is what we got. Okay. But basically, if you look, the body's in a, in a flat plane. Okay. But what we basically did is we raised the feet up above the head. So the head's lower than the feet, but the body's in a straight line. Contrast that with what's called the shock position, where you notice, yes, the feet are up, but basically the body, the main core of the body, is just flat. So it, the main core of the body is parallel to the ground. We're not at truly an angle, where the head is all the way down. Okay. When we get into transporting patients, we'll kind of talk, and talk about that, because Sometimes that Fowler's position is actually a bad thing, because ultimately what ends up happening is that, excuse me, if, as we put their head all the way down, all the intestines basically move up into the chest cavity, because basically gravity pulls them that way. By doing that, it's limiting the body's ability to breathe, because we're putting more weight on that diaphragm. That diaphragm doesn't contract as well. We don't move as much air, and that can create a problem if the patient's having problems breathing. So that's where it gets into where we need to talk about and differentiate between Fowler or um, Trendelenburg versus the shock position. So that makes sense, the difference between those two? All right. Now, if they're on their side, this is basically called lateral recumbent. Okay. There's left lateral recumbent and right lateral recumbent. All right, so questions on the terminology? Now we're going to get into body regions. This is basically kind of broken down into we have the head, the torso, and the, basically the lower section of the head. Right? And which some of y'all may get this, some may not, but we're just going to kind of cover it just to make sure, right? The cranium is basically the skull. It's made up of... Four bones, and then basically we have the face, and the face is made up of about 25, 30 bones. I don't remember exactly how many. But anyway, there's lots of little itty bitty bones that make up the orbital structure around your around your your face. Right. Mandible is basically the jaw. The neck is the neck. If that makes sense, right? Um, arm, elbow, forearm, wrist. I think everybody kind of gets that. The chest you'll hear referred to as a thorax. Abdomen is the stomach, okay. the pelvic region. Um, this talks about, let's see, the thigh, knee, leg, foot, neck, well, that makes all sense. The hip, sometimes you'll refer to, there's an area that's kind of missing, but the hip. So this bone here is called the, the femur. The, this end, so is that proximal or distal? Proximal. proximal. The proximal end of the femur, where it connects into, because that's basically kind of a ball and socket joint, where it connects into the pelvis, that part is called the hip. So actually this kind of, this area in here that you kind of feel where people go, oh, these are my hips, that's actually what it's technically referring to. So you can have a pelvic fracture, the pelvis is basically this girdle, right? A hip fracture is a femur fracture. So when we get to the trauma, we'll, we'll kind of cover that, but just so you see the difference there. Okay. Now, we also kind of divide the stomach up into areas. We do that to help isolate different organs, so where they're located. The most simplistic way to do this is basically there's four quadrants. So there's an upper quadrant, lower, or upper area, and a lower area, and a right side and a left side. So you have the left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. If you actually kind of Say you get involved with, with medicine and stay in it for a longer period of time. 
Some folks divide this stuff up into the six regions, some folks divide this up into the nine regions. They do it for their own purposes. For what we do, we're just trying to kind of give general descriptions. They do it and it gets a lot more precise and specific, but that suits their needs. So this is so just so you some folks may if you talk to folks they may say, well there's this other terms I want and they can explain it to you. So. So all we care. So when we get into the abdominal stuff, then all we're going to do is talk about. So what's here, all right? So the stomach, um, spleens here, livers there. And that's basically kind of what we do it for. And we just kind of go. It helps us kind of doing assessments, thinking in terms of the four. All right. So we have more. Is this the last one? No, it actually breaks down. Okay, so it actually does break down. Okay. So the last part of this is basically talking about body systems. So these are groups of organs that work together for a common purpose. Okay. So the respiratory system, right? So these are the things that help breathe. So obviously the lungs are part of that, but then you also have the diaphragm. You also have the trachea, the mouth, the nose. All of that's kind of associated with the respiratory system. Right? Now, you can also kind of do the digestive system. Right? So then obviously now, but we're still dealing with the mouth and the throat. Those are common to both of them. But now instead of going down the trachea, we're going down the esophagus and going down in the stomach and going out through the, through the rest of the body. So they can share common things, but they're broken in the systems to kind of help figure out what's wrong. So if I have chest pain, so if you think in terms of body systems, what are things that can cause problems inside my chest, right? So I have a musculoskeletal system. So basically the muscles and the bones, if, the, if I have a broken rib, that's going to cause pain. So the cardiovascular system, so if, so if I'm having a heart attack, that can cause pain. Um, the, the respiratory system, if I have a friction rub, so I have an infection in my lungs and it's causing a, a, a rub or, or there's an infection there. That can cause pain. So when you look at folks and they give you, they come up to you and they say, I have a complaint of whatever, there's a couple ways. Because ultimately what y'all have to do, what we have to do is figure out kind of what's wrong. And from an emergency medicine perspective, we kind of start to think in terms of what's going to kill you now. So generally, if you walk into an emergency department and say, I have chest pain, they're going to go, so what's probably, what's, a, what's high on the list of going to kill you quickly if you have chest pain? Yeah, yeah, so I have your big MI, right? So costochondritis, where basically it's a little irritation of the, of the of, or basically a inflammation of the cartilage in the, in the ribs. Not going to kill you now, right? So, but that can also cause chest pain. But as emergency medicine, the approach that we generally take is, we're going to assume the worst. We're going to start treating that. And if we go through and then a couple hours later, we kind of go, well, maybe it is costochondritis. And we can go, well, OK, so it's not the heart attack. It's costochondritis. So we'll stop this process and start you down this road. But the whole approach is basically going to, or the philosophy of emergency medicine is that we're going to treat in the worst case scenario. We would rather be. We would rather be overly aggressive and over treat than to miss something. Oppose that to family medicine. Right? So, you know, you're a 20 year old, you go into your family medicine clinic and you go, I got chest pain. They're going to go, yeah, you're 20. Statistically, it's not likely to be an MI. So they're going to go down a different pathway and start thinking in terms of, well, was it a pulmonary embolism? Is it, is it a respiratory infection? What are the other things? They're not going to immediately dive into and assume that it's an MI. So they're not right or wrong either way. They're philosophies. But ultimately what I'm trying to get to is start thinking in terms of the body and think in terms of region. So what are the body systems that I'm dealing with in these areas? So whatever the patient complains of, what are the systems that we need to think about? Because you start thinking systems, now we start thinking of individual organs. So is it the heart? Is it the blood vessels? Is it the lungs and the trachea? 
it, it's going to help you kind of start to head down the right path and to ask, start asking the right questions. Does that make sense? All right. So, all right, so the respiratory system. Okay. So it talks about the function. So what's the purpose of breathing? Well, right, but you said oxygen, right? So we, we, want, we need oxygen, right? So what do we need oxygen for? To enrich the blood cells. So the respiration. Okay, yeah. So ultimately what we're getting to is that with oxygen is the... It's an easy way to say this. If we don't have oxygen, the cells stop functioning. The cells have to have oxygen in order to produce ATP, which is an energy supply. No ATP, the cells don't function. The cells die, the tissues die, the tissues die, the organs die. You get a couple organs that die, ultimately you die. The opposite are basically, so that's half of the purpose. So when you breathe in, that's what we're trying to breathe in is, is oxygen. When you exhale, what we're blowing off is actually CO2, which is, for us, a waste product. So after we break down glucose and we get to the end, basically we end up with water and CO2. Well, the water we basically excrete as urine, or can excrete as urine, there's a whole other system there. But then the CO2 we can blow off and go into the atmosphere. And it kind of works well, because plants work the opposite of what we do. They need CO2 to function and blow off oxygen as part of their waste product. So it's a nice little relationship. And, um, so yeah, so there's the system. So now the parts of it, right? So coming down the main tube is the trachea. So the big tube, the big airway, the windpipe, as it is, okay? That trachea breaks, now you have right and left main stem bronchuses. These break down, ultimately ending up, and ultimately kind of what ends up in basically these little alveoli. And if you look at them, basically these things look like a little grape, a cluster of grapes. The alveoli is actually where the gas exchange occurs. So the O2 goes and enters the bloodstream. The bloodstream dumps off CO2. So get a general understanding now. When we get into the respiratory system, we'll kind of talk more, or y'all will talk more about this. But just kind of get a broad overview, right? So basically what this is, is in essence, if you kind of think about this, this is a big upside down tree. So you have the trachea, which is the big trunk. Now you have branches, and these branches progressively get smaller and smaller and smaller until you get out to little stems, and at the end of those little stems are leaves. Those leaves are, in essence, the alveoli. And the alveoli is basically the working, well, you know, in essence, the working function of the lungs. If you actually took all your alveoli and laid out and basically had a flat surface, it actually would cover a tennis court. So that's the surface area that we're dealing with. So it's a huge amount of surface area. Okay. This system is basically kind of fed. There's actually kind of two blood supplies. One actually feeds the cells itself so that the lungs can function. So it provides the cells themselves with the nutrients they need. On the other side is basically on these alveoli, on each of these little alveoli, there's a little capillary. And that capillary system is where the gas exchange occurs. That makes sense. So questions on this? Alright. So the circulatory system, right? So this is your heart, your blood vessels, right? So what you guys said a minute ago is the whole purpose of this is to pump blood around. And blood carries nutrients to the cells. So the cells need sugar, they need glucose, they need energy pattern, which is basically glucose. They need essential nutrients, um, proteins, so that the cellular structure stays intact. Okay? But then those cells produce waste products. The waste products gets picked up, basically dumped in the bloodstream, taken back, and either in the kidneys, where are we at? down here, somewhere. Right. So in the kidneys, it gets run through. The, the it gets the kidneys basically dump out a lot of the the waste. The other side of that is basically in the lungs where we blow off the CO2. Okay. So but this basically consists of, right, so the stuff that comes out of the heart, the blood vessels that come out of the heart are called what? What's the big category? 
from, well, I guess veins do too. So, but if it's going away from the heart, what's it called? Arteries. Arteries, yeah. So a blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart is an artery. A blood vessel that carries blood towards the heart is a vein. Right? And in the middle of those is our heart. Capillaries. Okay. And the capillaries, again, are kind of the workhorse. Capillaries get down into very, very, very thin, one cell thick vessels, chambers, or vessels, basically. Okay. Um, So musculoskeletal, so the purpose of the musculoskeletal system, what do we do? What is it, if we didn't have the skeletal system, what would happen? Blob. Yeah, you'd basically just kind of be a blob, like a little, little amoeba, right? <laughs> so that skeletal system provides structure. So what about the muscle side of stuff? Right, so it's basically movement and structure, right? Anybody know anything else? What else do the blood, what are the, trying to give away, the bones? Do they have any other functions besides structure? What are they? Well, you can just start IVs these in the, the legs now. You can, actually. Very good, yeah. So it's actually called an intraosseous. So you know, the normal IVs where they basically stick it in the vein, mm -hmm. they now, and basically, and it's related to something we'll talk about here in a second, but basically you can do the same thing by drilling into the bone. <laughs> the easy I.O. drill. There's a paramedic named Scotty Bowler. Um, actually, an outstanding educator. So if you ever get the chance to go listen to Scotty, you should go listen. Um, but anyway, he worked for Vitacare, the company that did it. There's a video of him being drilled as he's conscious and awake. What he says, it's about as painful as starting night. Which there's no, there's a minimal nerve receptors in the area and, and how it works. The painful part's actually when you start pressurizing the bone. So, but that's where hopefully they give you some nice medications <laughs> first so that you go, oh, thank you. So what it does, but what else do the bones do? Couldn't the bone marrow give like a, it's like a calcium storage for like the muscle? Yeah, so in bone marrow, what's bone marrow do? There you go, yeah, right? So the bone marrow, so the core of the bone produces red blood cells, which is actually kind of how the I.O. works. Because because most folks go, well, the bone, how does that relate to the circular system? But that's where all the red blood cells are. That's where the red blood cells are produced. And so there's a very good circulatory or relationship between the bones and the circulatory system. So that's how you can drill into the bone, give drugs, give fluids, and it actually gets in circulation and actually functions well. Yeah, the other thing that bones do are they're basically mineral storage sites. They store um, calcium and they store phosphorus. So good, let's see. Muscles. So what are the different types of muscles? Anybody know? There's really kind of three major categories of muscles. So cardiac muscle, right? So that makes sense to the heart muscle. Smooth muscle. Anybody know what smooth muscle is? Yeah. So basically all your organs, so like your blood vessels, your bronchioles, those are all smooth muscles. And then your skeletal muscles are basically movement. Alright, your nervous system. So what does this do? That's what gives you some feeling. Okay, yeah, so it gives us our senses, right? So basically touch, feel, heat, cold, sight, pain. smell, pain, yep. Okay. Yeah, what else does it do? This is what sends the signal from the brain to the muscles. For there you go, right? Yeah, because basically the deferent and afferent portions, right? So there's a part that the, where the brain sends out, right? So the fact that I'm pointing to my head, my brain sending a signal saying the finger should be extended and you should point it towards the head, and it works. The opposite, right? So I'm holding this, feeling this, and it's, the signal's coming back saying, yes, it's there, or it works. Okay. So the other part of that is also there's, so there's the 
be fair, well, there's the, the sensory movement side of stuff, but then there's also kind of the coordination of all the, all the organs. So you're driving down the road, <coughs> you pull out and an 18-wheeler smashes in. What's your response when you Brakes. Yeah, there you go, yes. Yeah, so, oh, expletive, 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 I'm going to go back. Okay. Yeah. Right. And while you're doing that, what's happening? What happens to your body? You I know. It. Yeah, right. So you basically have a process that's called the fight or flight syndrome. Right. So you basically have this large catecholamine dump. So that's the sympathetic system. So it controls the body. So basically it's preparing for a fight. So it's dumping a bunch of catecholamines in there, revving things up. It's kind of, it's, it relates back to a very primitive aspect, right? So when we were cave, and actually kind of even animals, I mean, you know, the, the animals basically kind of get either they're, they're going to fight or they're going to run away. So when they see something they don't like, they get kind of two choices. So my dog generally chooses to run away. <laughs> It'll bark at you as it backs up. Good. Yeah, so, so we can run away or go towards the fight. But either way, it's the same way. So if we want to run away, we want to run away fast. So we need to have that adrenaline dump and that energy dump. Uh, the opposite of that kind of nervous system process is kind of what happens at night. When you go to sleep, you don't want a big energy dump. You want to kind of slow the whole body down. So that sympathetic system kind of controls the, the excitation part of, part of it. The slowing down the eating process is kind of the, the parasympathetic system. So it basically controls all the organs. And a lot of that we do without even thinking about. Okay. So let's see here. All right. Um, oh, we did talk central and peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system basically consists of your brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system consists of everything outside of that. Um, and sensory motor, we talked about that. Brain, spinal cord, peripheral. Okay. Any questions on that? Right. So your endocrine is basically kind of one of the things I was actually just kind of talking about. The, now the nervous system sends the signals out to basically release these hormones. The endocrine system is the one that kind of regulates all that stuff. Right. But basically this regulates all the body functions. Right? So at night your endocrine levels kind of vary slightly and you go kind of into a repair process. Right? So if you're fixing to eat, it's going to release certain hormones and chemicals. If you haven't eaten in a while, it's going to release different hormones and chemicals. Um, if you haven't drinking any water and you're getting dehydrated, it's going to release different chemicals to make sure that you hold on to the water that you have left. Okay. So the whole this whole thing is basically kind of designed to maintain the body functioning in a normal system. So it's basically kind of a series of... Um, switches, but basically it's a, it maintains a balance within everything. So if we drink too much water, it basically allows us to get rid of it until we get back into a normal range. If we don't drink enough, it's basically going to conserve and, and uh, limit the amount of urine that we produce so that we maintain the normal functions. And the whole, anyway, we want to maintain, the body has a very narrow range in which it functions well. And all of this, these organs are designed to kind of keep us in, within that range. Okay, so the digestive system, right, basically we're going to absorb, so you eat food or we drink stuff, it's basically going to absorb those nutrients, break them down to the point where it can absorb them, and then it stores them, so, right, so we, when you eat, you eat proteins, carbohydrates, fats, it uses all of that and then what it can't use, it basically eliminates. So basically it eliminates the, the, the stuff we don't need and absorbs the stuff that we need. All right. Uh, <coughs> GIGU, um, basically again, that's the, the kidneys and the bladder. That's part of that that also helps maintain and filter and function, maintain normal homeostasis. Right. So it eliminates waste, maintains water and nutrient balance. So if we have too much salt, it can get rid of it. If we don't have enough salt, it'll basically kind of save it. You have too much sugar, it's going to basically eliminate it. You don't have enough, it's going to help try to save it. 
So again, it's, it's part of that intricate down balance of, of trying to maintain everything <coughs> in a normal function. Let me ask you this, is a bladder the same size as a, as a male and a female? Or? Um, 